Okay. Hello, my name is Ajay Gulati. I am the CEO and co-founder at ZeroStack. And in this session, we'll look at some of the cool new technology that we have built as part of our AI and machine learning engine and as part of automated fully up, uh, rolling upgrades. So going to the next um, layer of our seven layer cake here, which is essentially doing batch analysis for longer term decision making. So this is where the real machine learning and intelligence comes in, because now you are looking at data over long term, analyzing a lot of metrics, and then figuring out what to do next. And a lot of this stuff is done using Excel sheets by doing a lot of um, back of the envelope calculations, and we want to make it much easier for people to make these decisions. So going back to the car um, analogy a little bit, I think in cars we have seen the evolution where we started with cruise control, which is uh, very basic to all the built-in GPS. Now parking assist where you don't have to learn parallel parking anymore. Previously it used to be a big deal. To lane departure war warnings, if you are getting sleepy on the wheel, it'll tell you. And to the autonomous driving now. If I look at the evolution on the cloud side, again, we started with something where you basically do the design, build, operate, and troubleshoot yourself. Then we had some tools that would help figure out how to add more capacity. Then we want to know what kind of capacity to add. Is it more CPU, more memory, more storage, and what kind of storage? There are just too many dimensions now that we have to deal with. Then a lot of people are picking up some VM and running it on the public cloud. You need to know what kind of uh, VM to pick, because if you pick larger VMs, you are essentially wasting resources um, underneath. And finally, I think one of the biggest challenges in cloud in my mind is in a private cloud dealing with upgrades, because that is just a very hard thing um, to handle. So what we are essentially launching is a um, suite of operations which helps you take care of different things at different levels. So the first is the cognitive capacity planning, where it will tell you when your cloud would be um, out of capacity, and it will tell you on a resource by resource basis. So it's not just overall, it would say your CPU would run out in 37 days, memory would run out in 22, SSD based storage backend may run out in 67 days, and HDD maybe one year. So it would basically look at the consumption of each of the resources and predict over time how the growth is happening and the consumption is happening. We do the same thing for the project-based planning. So when you are within the project, you are consuming resources, and the project essentially is a mini data center, because it has all the boundaries in terms of CPU memory storage, and it will tell you what kind of stuff you can run on the project, and when would you uh, run out. And in terms of upgrades, we talk about um, upgrades which are driven through the SaaS portal. So in our case, we have a very unique upgrade architecture. Upgrade is you basically go to the SaaS portal. It will show you that the upgrade is available. You click on that, and there is a state machine that runs as part of the SaaS portal that knows where each of the host is in your environment, and it would walk the cloud through the upgrade process. So you don't have to have anybody babysitting the upgrade and figuring out what to do and it would migrate the workloads that need to be migrated as part of doing that rolling upgrade one host at a time. We also help with VM sizing. I think there is a common thing that we hear from a lot of IT admins. They say developers come to us, they always want a 32 vCPU and a 64 gig VM, and most of them don't use more than two vCPUs and eight gig of RAM. And we want to be able to help with that and tell them when they should be using a lower size VM and when they should be using, in fact, a higher size VM as well. And finally, this is again based on our real customer use case anomaly detection. In a cloud, a lot of people are going and running workloads. In some cases, a developer can just go in and launch a bunch of VMs. They may not be aware of security software, security patches, a lot of other stuff, and the VM may get infected. And we have seen a situation where somebody ran a VM 
it was running fine for a couple of weeks. It used to send about few kilobytes to few megabytes of data because it was running a web service. And suddenly one day it started spewing out about three, 400 Mbps of data outbound. And our anomaly detection would show an alert and say, okay, this is something really odd based on what we have seen in the past. And it turned out the VM was in fact infected and they really had to uh, shut it down. So this is where anomaly detection kicks in. So let's go through a couple of these demos here. So again, we are logging into the cloud and in this case we are logging in as the cloud admin. And this is just to show a little bit of the infrastructure. We have essentially four hosts. Each one is running about five to six VMs. And we created actually an environment just for Tech Field Day and you guys. So there is a project named Tech Field Day Austin. And we are running a bunch of workload as part of that project. So you can see that it has been running for about 1100 hours overall and there are seven VMs in it. Okay, so the main thing to note here is there is a planning tab on the project itself. So the planning tab on the project essentially tells you the overall health of the project where how much CPU is there, how much uh, memory is there, how much you are consuming. Then we have the first basic level insight where we look at the kind of VMs you are running and we say how many more can you run if you pick that size. So in this case, if you are running a VM of large, you can run three more of large before you run out of memory capacity. If you are running tiny, you can run 18 more of tiny before you run out of CPU capacity. So it tells you for what flavor, how many you can run before you run out of which capacity. Then the next thing is, for all the VMs in this project, it shows you the overall basic stats. It shows you how much they are consuming. And based on their consumption, it tells you the recommended flavor. So there is, there is a flavor which is the existing flavor. And then wherever there is a recommendation, it will tell you what is the recommended flavor. And if you agree with that, you can pretty much go and resize it on the same page itself. So there are uh, settings on the right hand side that you can use. And it also gives you the reason, saying why is it recommending that flavor? Why is it asking for a lower or higher based on what number? So that you have some idea. And then if you want to resize, you can do the resize right there. And then the only thing is, right now if you are doing a resize, it requires a reboot of the VM. So it's not a live adding of vCPU or removing of vCPU or adding or removing memory. Can you schedule <laughs> that? Um, so this essentially you can do whenever you want to do it because there is a reboot required. We talked to some customers saying, do you want to basically have a schedule? The problem is if they schedule it and then they forget, oh, it's going to go through a reboot at that time. It's basically on demand. Whenever you want to do it, you can go ahead and do it, and it's going to do reboot at the same time. Is the future planning uh, taking care of high availability? So can I configure to lose, for example, two hosts, and mm -hmm. then you make the prediction, to the future forecast? I see. So I think right now, I don't think we have um, a number that somebody would give saying, I want to plan for two hosts. Right now, we do plan for host failure. But I think it's a good feedback. If you think we should ask input saying how much a user wants to reserve, we can plan for that. Can you set it up so that at next reboot, then those changes get applied? At next? So like I'm going to like model the, like I'm going to be changing all of these virtual machines. And then the next time that I go, so imagine that I'm going to, uh, let's say I'm going to do some OS patching on a particular mm -hmm. virtual machine. 
So then I can go in and schedule, well, not necessarily schedule, but I'm going to plan that I'm going to change the oh. size of this virtual machine, and then I do my patching, it reboots, and then it resizes at that time. I see, I see. That's a good point. No, I think right now it's not uh, going to do unless you ask it to do. But you're saying if I do a reboot, then just do it if there is a setting for that. I think that will be useful. Yeah, we can add that uh, yeah, easily. The challenge is that the, um, the platform doesn't see an operating system reboot generally. Mm -hmm. All it would see is that the loss of heartbeat um, right. from the agent inside. And that was going to be my other question is, is it a graceful <laughs> reboot when you're, when you're doing it here? Like if I'm going to do it on demand, are you gracefully shutting down the, the operating system or are you just powering off a virtual machine and then? Oh, I think I, I need to check. I think it is probably a graceful reboot. Okay. I don't think it will go and do a where such destroy on the VM and trying to get it back up. Okay. Are these resizing things information available through the API as well, which would allow us to then automate? True. Actually, that's a good point. And I also got an answer during the break uh, from the team. So resizing is available through API, but the VM migration from VMware, that is also available through API. You don't have to go through the UI. So you can script it if you want to. And on the, that note, the capacity planning that you were saying you can have yeah, this flavor, this flavor, this many of the different ones. Mm -hmm. uh, what can that link into that? Like what uh, Josh was asking about, can that link in to say, I've got these 300 VMs, you have capacity for 200 of this size or 300 of this size? Like, is, that, is there a link there? Can there be a link there? I mean, I think right now we are showing you for different sizes. What we don't know is in future what percentage of what flavor would you end up picking. Mm -hmm. So this is to give you a guideline saying if you are using this flavor, you would run out of this resource. Right. Another one, you would run out of something else. What we can do is we can look at your current distribution mm -hmm. and say that based on that distribution, you can spin up another 10 VMs. Okay. It's another way of slicing and dicing the same information. Right. Can you resize yeah. when you're doing the migration from VMware? Yes, okay. we can. Because when you are doing the migration, it gives you the flavor on zero stack. And at that time, you can pick a different flavor. So that is possible. Great point. OK, so I think that was the resizing. Now let's look at the anomaly detection. And I'm going to do a little bit of a warm up here. We are going to go to a idle VM which is essentially not doing much, but we introduce spikes in that VM and see uh, what that shows. So in this case, there is a VM. It's, you can, in anomaly detection, you can pick a range so that let's say you have a performance problem that you saw and you say, look, I want to see if there was anomaly between last Monday to this Monday. You can actually pick a range. And in this case, we picked a range. And you can see it's a softball. There is an idle VM. It's, there are spikes. And it basically says that these spikes, they look anomalous because uh, you are not consuming that much resources before. Now it's at 100%. What, but this is an easy case, obviously. Yes. What, what's the interval that you do? And then do you do any averaging of that data? So actually, anomaly detection, it's a lot more sophisticated than just doing any kind of thresholding. Mm -hmm. Let me go through other two examples. Okay. You would see that it's a lot more complicated than picking average or threshold or something, because that won't work. Okay. okay. So as I said, this is what I call as a warm-up exercise. If you can't do this, there is a problem. But you have to be able to do much more than this. So now this was the simple case. Let's look at a VM which has a very highly variable behavior, because I think that's what you would see in uh, real life. So here is another VM. It has eight vCPUs. And here the workload is changing drastically. You can see that the VM is at 100% at times, and sometimes it's at lower. So now there is already a full range that is being spanned in terms of consumption. It's not easy to pick any threshold at this point. And again, we ran the anomaly detection, and there are 10 anomalies. And now you can see this is where the learning comes from. The VM, what we are doing in the VM, essentially, we are running a CPU program that essentially saturates one core, two core, three core, up to eight core. So the variation already goes from one to eight and back. And 
we actually did that in a pattern over some time. So we let it learn that this is the behavior in the VM. And then we just went in at arbitrary time and we do full CPU spike. And that's what it is calling as anomaly now. So now if you pick any simple thresholding based mechanism, that won't work here because the threshold is zero to 100. If you pick average, that's going to be something like 50, 60 percentile would also be very high. And this is where I think the real um, learning comes from. So you're using the term learning. Are you referring to something formal like machine learning and everything or, or doing math really well? I mean, I think there are um, standard techniques to do learning. So we are leveraging some of those techniques okay. to basically figure out what is the normal behavior and when are you deviating from the behavior. So things that it can do well is, for example, if you have a workload that does a certain amount on weekdays, but let's say it goes down on weekend, but there is one weekend there is a spike because of something. It would actually say it's an anomaly, yeah. things like that. The statistical methods or something yeah. like that. Yeah, That's yeah. That's what I call doing math really well. <laughs> I mean, I think the whole of machine learning is doing yes. math really well yeah, on a lot of data. Yes. And building some model and then using it. And you would have some false positives once in a while. You would have false negatives. Yeah. But that's where I think this is more to help uh, the developers and IT and admins. It's not something that you can just look at it and you can infer everything. And I'll show just one more, which is another VM that we ran, which is more of a uh, little bit more consistent pattern, but still ups and downs. And you'll see it can detect those edges as well. So here again, you can see there is some consistency. We run high load and we run low load and we go from zero to 100 over a certain period. But once you start doing it more erratically, it tells you that looks, there is some anomaly here. Okay. Next, let's look at briefly at the um, capacity predictions. So if you go, to, so in the cloud infrastructure admin view, if you go, it shows you the overall capacity prediction. And in this case, we were running an environment where we were adding more and more VMs, but suddenly we shut down a bunch of VMs. So it does the prediction of how the consumption is increasing. And then if you change, it would keep on changing the prediction over time. OK, now let's go to the Next thing, which is our zero touch upgrades. And this is essentially where we are upgrading the cluster from the cloud without the admin having to do anything. So the overall, the process works where we have, first of all, there are two kinds of upgrades that we have in the system. One is the SaaS portal upgrade or ZBrain upgrade that happens every week or every two weeks, where once you log in on a Monday, you would see new features come up uh, on a regular basis. And that's one of the key advantages of the SaaS portal. The fact that we are not shipping all the management software means that we can give you new features very quickly and we don't have to ask you to upgrade something on-prem. And whenever we do the upgrade, it's backward compatible to everything that is out there in the field. So we know what is the oldest version out there in the field and the upgrade is backward compatible with that. And we obviously ask customers to bring it up to the latest version so that we don't have to keep maintaining all of that. But that we have that information, so it's good for us. We are not blindsided by somebody running some older version. We gave a upgrade, and now uh, they have to deal with the consequences. On the cloud operating system side, this is where the upgrades are uh, done on-prem, and that's where it gets tricky. And this is something that we upgrade every three to six months. That's our regular cadence. And the upgrade is driven from the SaaS portal, and it runs as a state machine in the SaaS. And there is no manual dependency checks. No human has to understand how the upgrade is being done, which host is on what version. 
And if there is any problem, the state machine can do a rollback as well and move it back to the previously running system. And we have our own architecture on the host side where there are different partitions. There is a partition where the current software is running and then there is a new partition where the new software is installed. So it's much easier to do the rollback. It's completely risk free. Okay. So what we are going to do essentially, we'll have a cluster running on prem. We'll look at the version on the cluster and then we'll ping, start ping to a existing running VM on the cluster. We'll upgrade, uh, we'll initiate the upgrade from the cloud and you would see that there is almost no loss of connectivity to the VM. The VM does get vMotioned as part of the upgrade, so you may see few hiccups, but otherwise uh -huh, it's a fully uh, rolling upgrade. So let me go back to You can see here there is a cluster and it's running 2.3.0. So the versioning here is we have a cloud version and then we have a cluster version. So the there are four hosts and there is a VM running um, on Zhost 0. So you'll see now it would, so right now it's running on Zhost 0 and it has a floating IP address to which we'll start a continuous ping. So you go to the UI, <coughs> you click on upgrade cluster. And now what we are doing essentially is we are showing two things here. Let me just take a pause. On the left hand side, we are showing the state machine output. So we basically have written a script that tells you what is the state machine output saying, where is it in the overall upgrade process for every host. And then in the second terminal, we are running a ping to that VM continuously. Okay, so if you go to the host now and you just get a version from the host, you would see that all the machines are on 2.3.0. That's our current version. Okay, and then it's going through the process of preparing upgrade. So it's going to look at the system, it's going to do few critical backups of the state of the cluster, and then it's going to download the image and walk through the upgrade process. Is it possible to run different versions in a cluster or do I have to upgrade the complete cluster at once? So it is actually possible because that's how rolling upgrade works, that you have to be able to run different versions uh, in the cluster. So going forward, it's essentially you can have some nodes on 2.3, some nodes on 2.4, it would still keep on working. If that wasn't possible, it would be much harder to do a rolling upgrade because there is, if you have 100 nodes in the environment, it's very hard to do upgrade. I mean, anybody who has done vCenter, ESX upgrades, they know what it takes to go through a upgrade process. Do you, but you still do it at the cluster level, not the individual like host level, correct? So we are doing it at the cluster level, one host at a time. Okay. Yeah. So, so if we had to stop it for any reason, would, would that cause a problem or like how long could we run one version at you know one host or at this version and the other host or a different version? I mean I think it's not a preferred scenario to run it for too long. It should not cause a problem. I would say at that point the support team would be on alert mm -hmm. that if you stop it there and now you have mixed environment mm -hmm. that they would expect that you may call back and say oh something is uh, not right and then the support team would come in and take a look. Uh -huh. Is that something you alert in the SAS portal? Like that you have a cluster of different versions? I mean, it'll show you the versions of the host. It probably, um, I don't know if there is already a red alert to say that, oh, the versions are different, but it'll show you the versions and you'll be able to see a uh, discrepancy. So you can see here now it's going through the process. The hosts are downloading the new bundle and they'll go one at a time. And another thing that we do, so you can see now some hosts are already at 2.4 and the other ones are at 2.3. So now the cluster is already in that uh, mixed version state. So now three of them are at 2.4 and one is still at 2.3. So the last one is still going on. 
Okay, looks like all of them are on 2.4 now. The upgrades are done, the VM is still running and now if you go, you can see the version to be 2.4 on the overall cluster and if you notice the VM has moved from Zhost 0 to Zhost 3. It was running on Zhost 0 but now after the upgrade it was running on Zhost 3. Okay, because as part of Zhost 0 upgrade, we have to move the VM somewhere. Mm. Okay. Okay, I think that finishes all of our seven demos and I am just going to go through a little bit of um, summary of what all we talked about. I think the key feature here is that with the cloud uh, management, we can handle a lot of things that previously infrastructure admins had to handle. So for example, infrastructure management itself, um, integration of software, hardware, building up the cloud, storage management, network management, uh, upgrades, all of that is handled through the cloud itself. Then uh, the, the on-prem software also is essentially self-monitoring, so you don't have to deal with all of that as well. And you can migrate workloads from different clouds onto the same um, zero stack cluster. And finally, the monitoring, reporting, planning, these are critical pieces of a cloud. In most cases, you have to set up separate monitoring and operations cluster. In this case, that is a service we are providing through the cloud portal. So if you think of in VMware terms, if you have VC ops, it's like VC ops is running in the cloud. You don't have to install another cluster running that. And in terms of cloud intelligence, I think this is, we are just starting there. I think we are scratching the surface right now. We have built a few things, but we are planning to add a lot more because now we have built the overall infrastructure. We have data pipeline set up. We have uh, MapReduce and Spark job set up. Now it's a matter of just building more models and providing more insights. So later on in the year, we are planning to help with workload placement itself guiding people where they should be running which workload. If there is a workload that they run only a few times, that may belong to a public cloud. If there is a workload that they are running continuously, that belongs in the private cloud. So we can help with some cost optimizations as well. And finally, we want to help with application performance troubleshooting that may require having collecting some data from within the VM and then correlating that with the rest of the stats. Because right now, all the data we are collecting is coming from the hypervisor level. We are not putting any agents in the VM right now. So just to give a summary, at ZeroStack, we are essentially providing a uh, private cloud which is driven by cloud-based operations and artificial intelligence. It's a on-prem, self-healing, hyper-converged infrastructure and you can do single click mobility across clouds um, to really get a hybrid cloud um, infrastructure.